This is the iFlight Nazgul Eco, and like many of iFlight's newest drones, this has an anti-spark device built in that tries to prevent you having that horrible crackle when you plug in your battery. Unfortunately though, I think the one on this drone has failed, and today we're going to do a bit of a deep dive and have a look at what's actually going on, and we're going to talk about the fact that there is this device in there that does sit between the battery and the drone, and we're going to see if it's actually a good idea or not. Okay, now this new anti-spark device was a feature that iFlight introduced on the new Nazgul O3 edition. This was the version that launched at the same time as the O3 air unit itself. And it's a feature that basically prevents the battery sparking up on the connector when you plug it in. Since then, iFlight have introduced this on a number of their quads, including on this, the new iFlight Nazgul Eco. Now, this is a quad that I reviewed on the channel a little while ago. It's a bit more of a big bones Nazgul. You can see it's still based on O3, but if we look at the battery input, it's no longer on a connector, it's on a wire, and you can see that anti-spark device down there. Now, when these first come out, I did sort of raise a couple of question marks over how reliable these anti-spark devices were going to be, but I have to say, I haven't seen any issues being posted. Unfortunately, though, I think that the anti-spark device in this one has failed. Now, I don't believe that I caused this, but it did happen on the bench. I was doing a load of bench testing with this quad with the O3 ear unit and the Goggles 3. That's why the props are off it, because I was using this as my test bench to try and figure out what was going on with that disconnection issue. I was powering the quad up and down quite a few times on the bench, but that wasn't within short periods of time. It was every few minutes, and the basics are I powered it down, and one time it wouldn't power back on again. Now, just to demonstrate here that it isn't working, I'm just going to take a 4S battery. This quad is designed for 6S, but 4S will be absolutely fine for powering it up. And if I plug it in, nothing happens. It is absolutely dead. And at this moment in time, the only thing I can think of is this anti-spark device has failed. So, what we're going to do is tear it down and try and see if we can diagnose what is going on with this because I think it's relevant to understand this and whilst I haven't seen lots of posts of them failing as this one has, I think we need to get to the bottom of it. So the first thing we need to do is take the lid off the quad. Now, as I have said, this didn't happen in flight. So I can say that with regards to sort of risk factor, I don't think there's anything particularly to worry about on that side of things but it is interesting that it has failed i have always wondered about this because the way these anti-spark devices work is that they're basically a fet with a soft start circuit and the basics are that the negative terminal on your battery goes through it before it gets to your esc and the idea is when you plug the battery in there's no load on the battery and then after a couple of microseconds, milliseconds, I'm not sure what the timing is set to, it then opens up the main FET and allows it to connect. But that is after you have already plugged your battery in. Now, we'll just lift the lid off. And if we go in a bit closer, we'll then be able to see the anti-spark device there. So if we start lifting things up and removing things, so if we just get the antennas off, because I think we're probably going to need to move this TPU piece and we'll start popping that up out of the way that then frees our receiver for Express RS and then I think we'll pop our power cable wires out the back there and there that gives you a really nice view of the anti-spark device now, if I just grab some snips, we're going to undo the cable tie that's there, and this will allow us to look a little bit closer at what is going on and how it's wired, and then I can show you what actually happens. So, on this device, what we have is our main battery input, our positive just goes straight through to our ESC, so there's no input on that and the negative though comes down into the board 
you can see that there's a big fet there in the center you have the in and the out and through and then you have this little positive lead that comes off and goes down on to the positive pad of the ESC. Now we'll just check that this is all connected properly because if this did come loose this could cause it to fail but no nope, that all looks fine and that all looks correct on that side there and at this point it simply seems like the device has failed. Now if we plug the battery back in at this point here let's see what happens. You can see that there's no change there's no startup we're getting nothing happen at all. We're getting no power to the quad. I'm going to assume at this point it's this and not the ESC. But what we'll do is we'll get a multimeter on it and have a look at what we see. Okay, so I've got my trusty EV blog multimeter. What we're going to do is plug in our battery. And then what we're going to do is check very carefully the pads onto our ESC to see if there's any voltage so I'm trying to get my hand out the way so you guys can see and there you go you can see we are getting absolutely nothing at all making it through now if I just go down into here with my probe on the input might not be all the way in let's just go a bit further interesting I'm going all the way in there we're still seeing nothing at this moment in time am I actually right in definitely feel like I am in on the input now there we go that's better and there if we go onto the input to the FET you can see that we're getting 15 volts from the 4S battery so it is clear that the issue is that the spark saver is no longer working. Now, just something I've noticed is when this was plugged in, this is actually getting quite warm. Let me get my thermal camera out and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so looking at the thermal camera, if we power up the unit, oh wow, look at that instantly. You can see there that something is getting hot. Now it is in its protective cover at the moment, so it's going to be hard to show you, but clearly something there is getting very hot. Just looking at it under the macro lens, it's going to be hard to really show you it any easier under that. It looks like it's the IC. I think what we're going to have to do is get the plastic covering off it so we can have a closer look okay so i've now removed it from the quad and i've also removed the plastic covering as well now i believe it's that i see there that's getting hot but what we'll do is we'll get it back under the thermal camera and see what happens when we power it up externally there's no load on it at this point so it might not do it but if it doesn't i can always solder an xt60 on there and use it as a pass through okay so if we now power it up let's see what happens oh the it is very clearly that transistor there that is getting very hot. That is that five-legged one. Also, there's some heat on that resistor there as well. So something is dumping through that. But it is that transistor that is showing the most heat compared to anything else. I've just turned on the temperature tracking and you can see that it is well over 130 degrees. So yeah, that is not remotely happy at all. Okay, so looking at the board under the microscope. Now the two things that were getting hot was this resistor here and this little IC here. Now that resistor is labeled 30 times. I think that's something like 20 ohm. Could be 20 kilo ohm. I think it's 20 ohm. Oh, yeah, 20 ohm. That's what's coming up on the multimeter. So that is absolutely fine. Now, I'm not expecting the FET to be faulty. I would not expect it to be shorted because if it was shorted, it would be working. So if I just put my multimeter across it, no, it's not shorted. If we just check it to the gate, which is there, 16K. That's probably all right. If I really wanted to check this, I'd put it in diode mode here. So if I check the... The MOSFET in diode mode that way 
nothing coming through, which is good. There is a bypass diode on these MOSFETs, so if I go that way, there we are. 0.47 volt, which is correct. If we check down to the gate, 0.6, that's fine. So the MOSFET is fine. So at the moment, it's looking like this little IC here has failed. Now, there's no signs of burning or anything on it. Let's just get in a bit closer and have a look. It is labelled T118. No signs of burning or anything like that, but I guess it's failed. That, that, that's literally the only thing I can think of. That resistor there looks a little bit rough, if I'm honest, although I have been poking around with the multimeter, so that might have been me. I have been poking around a little bit just to have a look at the values. Uh, that was probably me, so I'd ignore that. Um, there's no sign of cracked caps. I guess we should check if that cap there is shorted to ground and that diode is working. Let's just... Sorry, let's get onto the right mode. No, that's fine. And as for the diode, let's put it into diode mode. Let's check that. 1.3 volts that way. Let's check it the other way. It's in circuit as well, 0.5. Yeah, that's fine. No issues at all. So the basics are, I suspect that I see has failed randomly. Now, after doing a bit of digging, the part number actually turns out to be T1IG. And going through the Texas Instruments converter, this turns out to be a TL331B voltage comparator IC. This basically compares voltage inputs. The likelihood is they're using this as part of the circuit for the soft start. They'll have the main voltage coming in on one and then that secondary voltage coming in via another transistor on another. And it's just adding a little bit of delay for that soft start startup via the FET. Now the next thing I'm going to do is get the quad repaired so let's get this all replaced. Okay, so the soldering is finished. I've got it on. We've got it on short saver. So let's test if it works. Good news. Let's turn it back off. We have power. So it's simply now a case of me putting it back together and we're good to go. So the quad is back together and it's all working fine now, obviously without this. Now, I do have mixed feelings on this device because... It's another point of failure. And whilst this didn't fail in flight, it happened on the bench. It shouldn't have happened. And it does raise questions for me on just how reliable these things are. Although I have to be completely fair in saying I've had no reports of failure on my Discord. I've not seen reports of failure online. And this could be a one-off isolated case. Now, it isn't particularly unusual for drones to have FETs on their power circuitry. It's not common in FPV drones, but pretty much every DJI drone has FETs on the battery, and that is what controls the power output. So this kind of setup isn't unusual. Whilst this FET here isn't designed to turn the battery on and off, it's designed to offer a soft start. The principles are the same. The FET either allows power through or it doesn't. On those drones, it has been very reliable and these things have worked, but this one has failed, so it does raise some questions. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say 
I don't trust the one I've got in my other quad. It's not failed. I'm not going to take it out and I'm not going to recommend you take these out. But I felt making this video was worth doing just to highlight the fact that these can fail. If you have an iFlight quad with the Spark Protector or Spark Arrestor built in and it's dead, that is going to be the main cause. Now, as I've said, I'm going to order some transistors and we'll see if we can do a repair on this one in the future. So if you're interested in seeing that, please do make sure you are subscribed. Now, that's it from me on this one. I just want to say, if you have found it interesting, please do consider checking out the links to my Patreon as well as buying me a coffee. It's only through the support of my patrons we're able to keep making content on this channel. And if you'd like to support us to allow us to keep making content in the future, please do consider checking out the links. I want to say a huge thank you to all of my Patreons. We would not be able to do this without your support. Anyway, that's it from me on this one. Stay safe. I will speak to you soon.